This is an interview on June 6th, 2020, with Molotov singer Kyle Brandt by Nick Perkel. Now, Kyle, what were some important events that led you to become the musician you are today? Wow. So probably just like discovering music uh, in my high school, like early college years. Um, I always grew up with music around. My dad loved music. My brothers loved music, but none were really musicians. My dad played acoustic guitar every once in a while. Um, but it wasn't really until I discovered... <clears throat> Well, I kind of just discovered whatever MTV fed me in the 90s, which uh, was a, you know, um, collaboration of rap, rock, punk. Um, I, I think I tended to gravitate towards, you know, um, some 90s rock, uh, Stone Temple Pilots, Alice in Chains, that kind of stuff. Um, it, it really got me into rock. And my older brothers got me into classic rock. But it wasn't until I really discovered Incubus when they came out is when like a band really blew my mind and made me think, wow, I want to, you know, I want to do that. So um, I started just singing along and dorking out on some of that. Um, and then that led me into like the underground music scene on the Internet, which was a little bit harder to find at the time. Um, that about was even, like Napster and stuff? It was kind of like pre-Napster. So even before peer-to-peer -peer became a big thing, I was hosting my own file server. And I started a online forum where a little like elitist music community was going on. And we were all sharing our music collections, you know, like ripping music off CDs that we would buy. And then uploading them as MP3s and sharing them out to each other. You and we about like the audio file community? Um, yeah, it wasn't so much as like live um, recordings, but more so just we built a, a neutral centralized database of music where we were all downloading and uploading each other music that we would find. Um, it really helped get other people into music that they would have never really found out about. And then Napster came along shortly after that, so that's when that whole thing went down. Now, can you tell me about your meditation techniques, and do you ever try to channel past life regression or experiment with uh, Ouija boards? <laughs> no, I've never done that. Uh, any Ouija board stuff. Maybe I did when I was like really young. Uh, me and one of my best friends thought our houses were haunted, so we would kind of play around with try and like figuring out the dead and possible ghosts and stuff like that. But um, I never really got into that too much. The meditation thing all started when I was just trying to take myself more seriously as a vocalist. Um, I reached out to Daniel Tompkins, who's the lead singer of the band Tesseract, among others. And I started, you know, really becoming serious about vocals and, wanting to pull them off live. I didn't want to do anything on recording or post-production that I couldn't pull off live. So um, to take that seriously, I, I figured out that, you know, a lot of singing is all about breathing. And in order to breathe correctly, you really need to just be in a certain uh, headspace or mind frame. To do that, I started practicing some meditation techniques, um, breathing meditation, um, and then that just, it just kind of like snowballed from there, getting getting into it, um, different techniques and, and different meditations, as well as hypnosis after that. Now, um, you received uh, vocal coaching from Daniel Tompkins. Can you tell me how you've grown as a singer through his mentorship and guidance? Yeah, um, for sure. I, and I would I'd love to do that because anyone who wants to start um, doing vocals more seriously. First of all, you can always learn from anyone, um, whether that be, you know, what to do or what not to do. So I think you should really keep your mind open and be willing to take upon any suggestions. Um, just be a sponge, learn from people. Um, everybody's got different experiences. The cool thing about Dan was he 
you know, it was a lead singer of a rock or metal band. So but when I first started taking vocal lessons, it was from classical teachers. Um, I didn't, you know, they had me singing songs that I couldn't stand to do, that I had no passion for. Um, I would I would give them musical demos and they kind of just looked at me like I'm not a metal person <laughs> or I'm not a rock person. So when I found Dan, it was like finding somebody that knew kind of the same thing that I was wanting to do. So it was real easy to relate on that basis. Um, he opened up his his um, website to kind of help vocalists do the right proper techniques um, to sing us to live a singer's lifestyle. Um, and there's a lot of aspects that go into that, which starts with, you know, body health and hydration um, and muscle memory, stuff like that. So it's not just, you know, the typical I don't think you're really born with a, um, you know, just you're not born with this magic ability to be able to sing. It just takes a lot of work and, and practice like anything, really. Were there any elements of like learning about nutrition, like say taking health supplements like spirulina or manuka honey or anything like that? Um, I haven't gotten into money supplements, but Dan also ironically has a side business with some tea. So there are some herbal teas that I've enjoyed using um, to to fulfill my hydration and energy. Um, and as well as just I'm at my best when I have healthy eating habits, um, meals like fish, uh, non fatty foods non-acidic foods or non-dairy foods um i don't always abide by that i always cheat but uh i always come back to trying to become as healthy as i can and, and live that lifestyle when especially when i'm doing live shows because in a live show you you have to be at your best you can't stop and then start over again on the recording you know what kind of love do you have for newer progressive bands, I guess, such as Steak, a.k.a. Steak Number 8 from Belgium? Uh, so that band's actually brand new to me. Um, you, I had no clue about them until today when I gave them a listen earlier. And I have to be honest, I didn't get through the whole thing. I mowed the yard, and I really wish I actually would have just put the CD, that uh, album on at the get go because I got a couple like three tracks in to um I think Critical Method is the C is the album yes. you sent me and and like even, like three tracks in I at, at first I was like I don't know if this is for me but uh three tracks in I was like yeah this is gonna hit the spot at some point when I'm, I'm really like aching for wanting to hear something like this. So I'm it's really cool that it's on my to do list. Um it by first uh, first impressions is it reminds me of Ocean Size, which is one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, they have this like gritty vocal, but it also gets melodic at times. And that's what you have to have to pull me in. Um, since I'm a vocalist, that's the first thing I listen to is vocals. So I'm not, and I used, I've been through a many stages of different vocals um, and what I like personally. I'm at the stage right now where I'm not, I don't have the angst I did when I was a younger kid. So I like more melodic, lighter vocals. So, um, but at the same time, I also like some aggression at certain points. So as long as you can blend and mix the two, uh, you're gonna pull me in. Um, if, but sorry if I gotta say, if it's like 100% uh, angry, like angsty vocals. I'm probably just not going to be into that much more nowadays. Now, can you tell me about the history you have with the group of musicians you chose to work with on uh, Tribunal? Yeah, sure. So, um, like, I never really sat out with any intentions or goals to write an album. Um, a couple of these songs just was me, you know, being bored as a musician sitting at home and, and writing different riffs, different piano parts. Um, and then they just kind of sat in my folder for a little while. And then 
um, I have another band that I sing for live, and it's called A Light Within. It's kind of like a shoegaze, um, prog, post-rock band in Kansas City. And while they are busy writing new material, I just got a little bored um, as a vocalist. So I just started working on some of my own ideas. Um, and then I, I had some friends that were just like, hey, what are you up to? And these are these are buddies that I've known from the local scene for the past 10 years. And they're just like, hey, what are you, what are you doing today? And I'd just be like, oh, just sitting at home bored writing some music. And they'd be like, you want to jam? And I'd be like, okay, sure. So they'd come over and, you know, I'd start, I'd start off with just a single guitar riff and I'd start building from there and seeing if anybody wanted to incorporate any of their ideas with, a uh, with some of the stuff I was putting out. And then, um, we got my buddy Bryant who did the, uh, was on the first single that I just released confessional lock. We did that one and it ended up happening pretty quick. And I was just like, holy crap, I have a full song here. We need to, you know, get together a few more times and see if we can get an EP together. Um, so then from there, we met another time and he threw down some guitar on another song. It really came together. And then from there, I was just like, holy crap, I need a bassist. I reached out to my, my old pal, Madeline, who was in my band called Sybil. It was a short-lived band. But I was really pumped up about it at the time. Um, in fact, I'm still pumped up about it if those guys wanted to get back together. Um, she wanted to throw down some bass to some stuff and learn some Pro Tools. So I helped her buy the right computer, gave her some Twitch tutorial lessons, had her come over, taught her Pro Tools and how to record all of her stuff at home and then send it to me and that's basically how that happened so she threw down bass on pretty much every track on the album now, i guess what kind including of some guitar so it's really it was really just collaborative sorry go ahead yeah um i guess do you feel like you finished on that question i was just gonna say it was it was really collaborative um a lot more online than in person um especially it just has people get busy, you know, it's harder to come over. So with Madeline, it was kind of just like me sending her stuff and her throwing down bass lines and sending it back. Now, what kind of experiences in your life inspired you to move forward, I guess, from the music you were creating with A Light Within to uh, composing your debut solo release, The Tribunal? Um, I think just lack of material. So... A light with the light within guys write really organically slowly um they have practice once a week and get together and jam things out really live they don't really utilize dropbox or online recording technology to write so you know as i kind of wait for them to present material i have to keep myself going and keep bettering myself at what i do so that and at, at the same time, I wasn't, I haven't really been open to go out and search for another like full time band to be a part of or anything like that. So it really fit my lifestyle at the time to just kind of work on things myself when I was wanting to do it when I was expi inspired um, and not have to really rely or wait on anybody else. I saw a quote from you online where you said the tribunal explores condensed meditation techniques to help balance the anxieties that stem from feelings of accusation, entrapment, and confinement. Can you throw out some songs that exemplify this technique? And what was the most cathartic one for you to compose as well as record? Okay. Um, yeah, and when I, I like to um, kind of enunciate the word condensed because when you're doing meditations and some of the clips I have in the album, they're, they really are condensed. So they're, you know, realistically, I can't throw a 20 minute or a 40 minute meditation on an album. That's the length of an album itself. So I really had to cut down a lot of um, spoken word and make the just make some key phrases in there to blend into the following song so that's what i meant by condensed um 
And it was, it's kind of just a, a concept that gets people open to the idea. If they're very unfamiliar with meditation, it just kind of gives this brief introduction of this is what it kind of feels like when you do a meditation, but it's not really the whole, you know, it's not, it's not meditation in its fullest. It's just a glimpse into it. Um, I, I've always been a very, very big proponent of concept albums experience with meditation into a song i thought it was kind of a cool idea to keep going and expanding on that and make it kind of conceptually into this album as it grew um i think uh i like uh, i want to say i'm really partial to the very first track on the album meditation because that's the very first one i wrote um i kind of played with samples and put that together and it it flowed right into confessional lock. Um, and so I'm kind of partial to that one. Now, thinking about what we just talked about, how do you, these techniques also contribute to the um, penultimate track, Meditation Guided? So, first of all, there's multiple different types of meditation. And so I tried to give a little glimpse into different examples of how the spoken word author is presenting these ideas. Um, guided is more of a guided meditation. So she, the spoken word author is walking you through different steps and guiding you through those steps to get to the point of, you know, counting down to zero in that track. Um, I think the way that it's set up just really flows um, into incarceration as well as you get more of a glimpse through each meditational track. So, you know, track one, transcendental, it gets you like introduced and then mindfulness and then guided is a little bit longer. So you, it kind of like eases you into the process throughout the album. I've read that your song, uh, Verdict Hope, is your favorite track on the album. Um, in the piece, I noticed like a real personal struggle you're fighting with. Can you uh, fill me in on the story of that track? Um, it's, I don't know if it's too personal. I tried to, I always, and I tr always try and do this, is write metaphorically so that the way I write is, you know, I can connect to as much fan base as I possibly can, and I can write it from multiple perspectives. Um, I do have an overall theme for the album as far as a person going through some, um, you know, uh, you know, different stages of grief as they are possibly misjudged. Um, Verdict Cope is lyrically written about someone being misjudged by a judge um, or someone being misrepresented by someone who's supposed to represent them. It's my favorite track, probably just because vocally it's so, um, it's got, it's got a lot of different styles in it. And that's why it's probably my favorite, just because it's got a lot of different styles. Now your song, the wizard send me an angel. Um, that was a cover taken from the classic eighties movie about video games. Just wonder, how much of a gamer were you when you were little, and what systems did you have growing up? Oh, man, that's an awesome question. Um, I've always been a gamer, so I grew up in the 80s. I think my first, uh, let's see, my first games were probably like on a Commodore 64, which my dad bought at a garage sale and brought home. So I was learning how to play video games on a computer, which was inputting a floppy disk and writing, or you know, doing run commands to that in order to run the game. After that, uh, Nintendo got really big, so I think I got my first Nintendo in 87 or 88, and, you know, played Mario, played a lot of games on regular Nintendo. And obviously, after that, I kept up with Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, PlayStation, Xbox. Um, I don't I don't do a whole lot of console gaming anymore, but I still do PC gaming. Um, and that's about gaming. Sorry, did I miss answering any part of that question? It seemed like that was a two-part question I only answered one part of. No, no, I, I mean, I was just going to follow up. Like, I mean, I 
really, really am in love with the TurboGrafx-16 and also have a Neo Geo that's like the absolute prized things in my gaming collection. Um, do you have it at either of those systems or have you ever played them? Oh, man. Um, yeah, I remember those. TurboGrafx-16, I never had. One of my buddies had it, so I would go over to his house and play it every once in a while. But if I remember correctly, those were expensive at the time. And when they came out, they were kind of a flop because they had a certain amount of games. And then it, they never really got to the point of Nintendo or Sega. Um, kind of just... And then and then Neo Geo, of course, like I remember back in the day, those those things were like six, seven hundred dollars to yeah, get. That, that was and like I, the rich kid system. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I wasn't one of those kids. So, I, yeah, I never had a Neo Geo. I never saw a Neo Geo. I don't even know what they look like. Um, but dude, I knew that they were, they were emulating games that were in the arcades at that time. Dude, like, dude they weren't uh, emulating those games. They were like, it was an arcade translation. Like, I was actually, when I was in Japan for a year, I actually saw one in a game store. And it's just like, the price was right. And it was just like, Merry Christmas to me. Like those, the cartridges of the games are literally the size of the system. They're they're fucking huge. Also, wow. the controllers. It's just like if you have like a laptop in front of you, the the controllers are literally about the size of the laptop. And they're joystick based, right? Yes. Um, they also have the really small ones that are kind of like the size of like Super Nintendo controllers too that you can get. <laughs> if you could find one for a good price, go for it. But otherwise, it's like the retro gaming market on eBay has really, really driven up the price of that stuff. Like, I mean, I got that like in the early 2000s when you could get that type of stuff really cheaply. But um, same thing, too, with the TurboGrafx-16. Like, I actually, um, back in the 90s, I got into this thing called X-Band, which was like the original gaming, online gaming type thing, and I actually bought, like, the CD add-on for the TurboGrafx-16, and I have about, like, 10 or 15 CD games for it, but um, it's just... I really kind of, like, got into this type of stuff at just, like, a stroke of luck. It's not like my... Uh, the way I, I did it, it's not kind of like the way that most people can get the stuff. Yeah. Man, I didn't even know TurboGrafx-16 had a CD attachment. Dude, yeah. dude, in Japan, it was like, it was called PC Engine, and that was like the big system to have. Like, in Japan, it was fucking huge. Wow. Yeah, I mean, like, at the, at the time, like, in the U.S., we didn't really know about what was going on in Japan. I remember having a subscription to Nintendo Power, and sometimes you would read, like, a little bit of things, and you'd be like, wow. Because I remember when uh, they released the Final Fantasy games for Super Nintendo. I, I loved those games. And Final Fantasy three in the U.S. was, like, Final Fantasy five or six, six. over in Japan. Yeah. So... I was that blew my mind. I was like, no, it's Final Fantasy three, and someone's like, no, it's Final Fantasy six, and I was like, what do you mean? Well, in Japan, they have all these. Other, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, I always, like, I got into like a bunch of Japanese games also for like Super Nintendo, which is called Super Famicom over there. Um, it, it all that stuff, like the, the import community, it, it was just nuts, honestly. But, um. If you're really into it, go for it, you know? Yeah. I do have a Raspberry Pi now that I open up every once in a while that has all of the regular NES, uh, Super NES, and Sega Genesis games, some Sega CD games, stuff like that, um, just to just to replay some of my childhood. Oh, that's awesome. For, like, last year, I think I started playing Final Fantasy three again um, and just ran through it because final fantasy 3 is one of my favorite games of all time i know you've talked a lot about a love for some of the classic 70s rock and prog albums in interviews i wonder if you could throw out kind of like some hidden treasures like say the flower traveling band satori or makeup albums that have influenced you as well so not like major known bands well i mean like a, give me something to kind of like 
you know, like, open up somebody's eyes to it. Oh, man. Um, God, I don't feel like I'm educated enough in that era to know anything that that I could open someone's eyes to because a lot of the stuff I was into was all really mainstream stuff. Um, my dad got me into the doors. So I've really loved the doors all my life. Um, I think vocally, I, I really take a lot from Jim Morrison. Um, my tones very similar. Uh, Pink Floyd's probably my favorite classic rock band. Um, and, uh, um, albums like Animals, that that album just is probably my favorite of all time. So I suggest everybody listens to that one. Um, Led Zeppelin, I got really into Led Zeppelin for a while. Uh, um, Steely Dan might be totally off the wall. I love Steely Dan. Um, I'll, I'll rock the hell out of Steely Dan anytime I'm at the lake and drinking some beers. Um those are probably like the main ones that I can. Oh, and uh, Genesis, love Genesis. Um, both Peter Gabriel and Phil Collins. Um, so those are really like my my faves when it comes to classic rock. Now, do you have any fresh ideas or something that musicians that have been around for a while can do to sustain their fan base, as well as the local scene that they're a part of, considering the current nationalist world worldwide situation that's going on right now um and honestly i need to take more advantage of that if i can find the time but i always one band that always is up to the latest of doing something unique is tesseract and uh, you know a few members of that band right now are doing twitch streaming so my vocal coach, Daniel Tompkins, you can go out and he's doing Twitch streaming um, vocals, you know, production. He's basically just opening himself to the community to watch what he does um, live. So he'll be writing songs, um, producing vocals, writing guitar, um, just gaming, anything. He just He's just putting himself out there on Twitch. And I think Twitch is the platform really for artists to connect with their audience at this point in time. Now, can you tell me about your most hallowed memory about buying one of your first albums in your collection at a record store? Uh, let's see. So the first album that I probably bought, it was probably, well, it would have been a cassette tape. Um, Oh, I think I know what it was. It was probably like Young MC. Um, if you remember the Bust a Move song that came out, I was, I don't know, seven or eight years old. So I think it was Stone Cold Ryman or something was that album. And uh, I loved that album as a kid. So that was one of my first favorite cassettes. But at that point in time, it was really listening to the radio and hitting the record button on your cassette tape and just building like custom mixtapes that whatever was playing on the radio at that time. When it came to CDs, I think my first CD that I purchased was a Steve Miller band's greatest hits um, because it was one that it was a band that I liked that I could actually buy because I was under 18 and anything with a parental advisory sticker on it, you couldn't buy if you, unless you were 18. So, um, Steve Miller Band Greatest Hits is my first CD. Uh, listened to the hell out of that. And honestly, I can't remember a whole lot of CDs. Um, but I did buy a crap load of them. Now, would you like to go back to any questions? Uh, not really. I'm a blabbermouth, so yeah. I, th I think I blabbered a lot on all of those answers. Final words. I, anybody who's listening to this, I, it's very appreciated. If you listen to my album, it's very appreciated. I thank you for your time um, because I know everybody's super busy nowadays. I know it's really hard to sit down and listen to a whole album, and that's the way my album's really meant to be listened. Um, so I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your ears. And also thank you to my friends who were involved in making this album. It's it's uh, kind of a dream come true, even though I 
it wasn't really ever a goal or a dream. It just kind of accidentally happened. And uh, if you inspire to be a musician or or release your art, just you know, practice hard and, and release it and don't be scared. And thank you, Nick, for this interview. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been an interview on June 6th, 2020 with Molotov singer Kyle Brandt by Nick Perkel.